Number 493 in our hymn hymnals. Hymn 493. Like a woman at the well. Let's all sing. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. Then I heard my Savior speaking, Draw from thy well, touch never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul, bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me full. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasure that lives in the world. But that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, and lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no. So, my brother, if the things this will get you, live on those that won't pass away. My blessed Lord will come and save you, if you deal to him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Amen. Please back to you. Ah, uh, thank you, Tracy, for that session of singing. And to take this opportunity to welcome Calvo. I don't know if he's in. Mm, I can't see him. I'll stand in for him. So, and to welcome our speaker, Robinson Otieno. Uh, he's been with us since. Uh, Monday, and uh, indeed we've been blessed so much. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to welcome him to take the floor so that he can continue speaking into us. So, Brother Robinson, yes, please, you're highly welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, let me take this opportunity to greet us in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe you are finding the Lord. He has taken good care of you this particular day, especially that it was a preparation day. And uh, as the sun is setting, it's our desire that the sun of righteousness will arise in our hearts with healing. And especially that we are entering into the ages of the Sabbath, 
We pray that the Lord prepare our hearts to listen from him, to know his will, to find repose from our labor, to find rest at his feet, to know what it is, his will is in our lives so that at last we can be prepared for his soon and second time. You'll uh, forgive me, uh, I've been having a little cold today, but I believe that God is going to take us through uh, sufficiently. If you notice some changes in my voice, could be it's because of the cold. I'll apologize too for the uh, few interferences that we had yesterday at my place. We had the blackout, and that is why maybe you noticed there were some interferences in the midst of the uh, presentation. Nonetheless, we pray that the Lord is going to take us today safe to the end of the study. So, shall we be believe and pray? Our loving Father in heaven, for the privilege of being called your children and even for the privilege of worshiping you even through uh, the internet. It's our prayer that now, God, as we flip through your inspired word, that you will inspire our understanding by the aid of the spirit, that which you have prepared for us to learn this evening, you are going to bring it with the power, with the urgency, and also with the compassion that it be serves, that our hearts are going to work out a salvation, preparing us for your soon and second return. It used me into nothingness as you and you alone be uplifted now, as you draw men to your presence, I included. Take care of all the human instrumentalities that we are employing in this particular service this evening, so that we'll have minimal interferences, if possible, none, so that the message can be clear, precise, and all your children can be ready to make decisions in line with what you speak to us this evening. Thank you for listening and answering in line with your will that is perfect because you've prayed, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, welcome again to our fourth presentation, if I'm not wrong. And the Lord has allowed us to travel through three important subjects, building upon our theme, import the important. That is a theme that we have been operating on all this while. And our guiding text has been Isaiah 59, uh, 54, uh, rather, verses 1 and uh, 2. And we've been operating on that throughout. So this particular evening, we are also still going to uh, major on that particular theme. And our topic of study this evening, will the investigation favor you? Our topic of study is, will the investigation favor you? That is our topic of discussion. If today it happens that you are uh, caught with the arms of the law, and it's, it is required of you to be investigated, that will be a period that will be subjected to a lot of mental torture. Even if maybe you know you are, are not guilty per se, but because of human nature, fearing on how the legal process will come out, you may be a little bit worried of your state. But as the state of the world is currently, some may not be worried because nowadays justice is rarely achieved amidst our courts or our legal system because it has become corrupt in one way or the other. It's who knows who's to some extent, not in every case, of course. We still have faithful members of the bench who are rendering service as though to God and not to men. Nonetheless, a normal judicial system, when you are subjected to it, there's some worry that comes with it. And so the fundamental question we are going to ask this particular evening, will the investigation, will the investigation favor you? And I'll call your attention to the 18th chapter of the first book of the Bible, that is the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter of the first book of the Bible, as we roll down our topic, will the investigation uh, uh, favor you. And you're going to read from verse one. We'll be reading as usual as we've done. We'll be doing an exposition of chapter 18 and chapter 19. So just follow me closely with your Bible so that we know which parts exactly we'll be drawing our lessons this evening. Now I read from verse one. And the Lord appeared unto him. Him there is Abraham in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, verse 2. And, his, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and Lord, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself 
toward the ground. Now, Abraham has received a special visitation from heaven. There are three beings from heaven which have paid Abraham a visitation. Now, one of them is identified as the Lord. And that is why in notice verses 3 says, and said, he approaches the three, but the Bible says in verse three, and said, Abraham said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Now, Abraham approaches three men, but he only refers to one as my Lord. Verses two as well, the concluding part says, he bowed himself toward the ground, towards only one of them. So notice these inhabitants of heaven who have come to give Abraham a special visitation amongst them is somebody who is more than an angel, who is more than just an inhabitant of heaven. And this is Jesus Christ himself. That is not the burden of our study to prove that, but that is Christ who came alongside those two angels to offer very important mission on earth, especially they come, one, to give Abraham a message that he is going to give back to a son through whom the Messiah or the Messianic prophecies will be fulfilled. Two, they have come to give a warning of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, let me say it another way in line with our study. They have come to investigate the activities taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah, whether they can spare them or not. So chapter 18 from verses 1, as you move downwards almost up to verses 15, actually to verse 15, that is a scenario where the message is being relayed to Sarah and Abraham of the battle of Isaac. But after that, well, that which forms the basis of our study this evening, verse 16, the Bible records there, and the men rose up from Pens from there, and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Now, these men who came to bring tidings of the birth of Isaac, as well on a mission to Sodom, after they are through with their mission at Abraham's place, they turn to their second mission. Now, follow me closely. I'm building a foundation to our study. Remember, our topic once again is, will the investigation favor you? And so when they turned their faces towards Sodom, the Bible records, verse 17, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? That statement blew my mind. How? The Lord is preparing to reach out to Sodom and Gomorrah to do an investigation. I'm choosing my words keenly in line with our topic. So don't lose me. Let me not lose you as well. Follow me closely. The Lord is preparing to offer an investigation at Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. And before he leaves, remember, they are through with the mission at Abraham's place. After they are through, they set off for another mission. But Jesus is disturbed, if I use that term. Jesus is disturbed. Am I going to set out on this other mission without telling Abraham? Actually saying, shall I have anything from Abraham? Why is it that the Lord does not want to hide anything from Abraham? Verse 18, the Lord says, seeing that Abraham, shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Verse 19, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which the Lord had spoken. Now look at that. The Lord has some confidence in Abraham that he is one who will not only have Isaac be born in his family, but he will instruct Isaac and all the members of his household to look forward to the Messiah who is supposed to be born, to live by the will of God, to follow the instructions of Jehovah. Now listen, and I understand why the psalmist writes the 25th Psalm, especially verse 14. He says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and the Lord makes known to them his covenant. I repeat that again. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and that is why Jesus asked himself, 
Will I hide anything from this man, Abraham, who is my man, who I know walks in the path of duty? I cannot hide it from him. Listen, throughout all uh, Christian experience and the children of God, it has proven that all who trust in the Lord and walk in his will, the Lord does not hide anything from them. When Joseph was in the prison of Egypt, when the butler and the baker had dreams, the Lord allowed him to interpret it. When Pharaoh had dreams, the Lord allowed him to interpret it. When Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel were in the servitude of Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and forgot it, the Lord gave it unto them. So the Lord, who is not a respecter of person today, he will reveal his mysteries to anybody who walks in the fear of his name. Let that sink in the heart of each and every one of us. Do you want to know anything from God's word? Do you want to discover the oracles of God? Do you want to discover the secrets of God from his word? Walk in his word. Walk in his will so that the Lord cannot hide anything from you and me. That aside. Now the Lord decides to face Abraham with the reality of matter. Verse 20. The Bible says, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ. He's saying, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah has grown high. The extent at which they're going against the principles of heaven is too high. What will I do? I will go now and check. Let me put a word in line with our topic. I will go now and investigate. I'll go and do an investigation whether the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah have decided to turn back their faces of me. If not, Jesus says, I will know, let me add, what to do. So these out, the two angels are sent out on expedition, on an investigative mission to Sodom and Gomorrah. Follow me closely. Notice that there was iniquity in Sodom. The Lord here is sending angels to do an investigation. Let me say it another way. The inhabitants of heaven have come to do an investigation on how the inhabitants of Sodom are living in line with heavenly warnings. Let's proceed on. And the Bible say they proceed. And as they proceed, the Bible records in verses 23. Let me start 22 first. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now, they are out to do an investigation. Abraham remains with Jesus Christ. What does he do? Verse 23, and Abraham drew near and said, will thou also destroy the Russians with the wicked? Follow me again closely. Out on an investigative judgment are the two angels. Abraham here pause and I say, okay, Jesus, you have come to investigate the children of Sodom and Gomorrah, whether they're walking in your path. Okay, that is a good message. Nevertheless, Abraham reflects that at some point back, he had given his life. I'm choosing those words uh, intentionally because we are going to use them to build up to apply the study to us. Abraham remembers that in Genesis 14, he had sacrificed his life for the sake of rescuing Lot. When Sodom was attacked with the four kings, he had set aside 300 men, risked his life to attack four strong kings so that he could rescue Lot and his family. And when this clicks on the mind of Abraham, he starts to intercede on behalf of Lot and his family. An investigation is going on down in Sodom and Gomorrah. Here we have Abraham remembering I had sacrificed my life to save Lot sometimes beyond. Uh -uh. I cannot allow him to be destroyed with the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. What will I do? I am going to set out my heart to intercede for Lot and his family and all the righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah before Jesus Christ. And so he starts and tells Jesus, now that you're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, we are in verses uh, um, 
26, it says, and the Lord said, if I find, no, 25, uh, 24, sorry, peradventure, there be 50 rushers within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 rushers that are there in? 25, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the rushers with the wicked, and that the rushers should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of the earth do right? You notice Abraham is interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. And when interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham says, if you find 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy them? He said, no, God says, I won't do. What about 45, God? He says, I want to. What about 40, God? I won't do that. Then Abraham says, okay, before the patience of the person who is interceding rush out, I'm going to now start moving down in counts of 10-10. Moving out, reducing by five. Let me now reduce by ten. It says, "What about thirty? What about twenty? To a point that the Lord now at last leaves Abraham's. Abraham makes an intercession on behalf of Lot and his family. Let me join what you've seen so far. One, the inhabitants of heaven have come to investigate the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two. Abraham remembers that he had given up his life for the sake of rescuing Lot and his family. Three, that prompts Abraham to start interceding for the righteous people, especially Lot and his family in this particular time. But the question is, by the time the inhabitants of uh, heaven are going to investigate, they have gone there to pose a warning, and Abraham is interceding. What are the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah doing? Chapter 19 now, move with me there. Chapter 19, the angels are already inside Sodom and Gomorrah, and they've been welcomed into Lot's house. And the Bible records in Genesis chapter 19, uh, verses 4, it says, uh, the Bible says, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lord and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Hmm. Look at that. Abraham is busy interceding for the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, while the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, who are wicked, are busy looking for a way to defile the messengers of heaven, hence defile their message. Don't lose track of that. And the people who were struggling for this were not Christians per se. If we had Christians that day, they were not believers. If I use a good term, which is uh, Will Marwell with our study. They were not believers. They were unbelievers who were seeking to destroy the message by destroying, by defiling the messengers whom the Lord had sent out. Follow me closely. The next step, Lot comes out, verses 6, and Lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not do so wickedly. Then verse 8, Lord gives a proposal that I want you to listen so keenly. Or if you're reading, take it so keenly with me. It says, behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye unto them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Hmm. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah are now being convinced of another way. Lord says, uh -uh, I have nothing to do with my guests. I have two virgin daughters. Don't lose that. I have two virgin daughters. They have never known a man as, as much as, as far as I'm concerned as their father. I know they have never known a man. They are pure. Have them. But the men of Sodom insist, mm -mm, we are not in need of your daughters. What we want are those men. I want you to notice, the Bible does not record, but I want you to think for a while. When the father proposed to the inhabitants of Sodom that he has daughters who are virgins and they can be given out, what do you think came into the minds of his daughters? Do you think they were ready to go out to the men of Sodom? 
Do you think they were annoyed with their father's proposal? Do you think they were like, what is wrong with daddy? Why is he acting in an unrighteous manner? Why does he want to compromise our purity for the sake of two men who can as well defend themselves? Do you think that was their mindset? We'll find that shortly. So let's proceed on. They press on, they press on, and the Bible records at last what happens. The two angels come outside, strike them with blood, let's close the door. And there is where I want us to look in. And the Bible records, excuse me for that, the Bible records in verse 10, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. When they realized that the men of Sodom were not in need of the message of the grace and mercy which God has brought unto them, the door was closed for the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their probation ended right there. And the next thing that follows in verses uh, 12 says, And the men said unto Lord, Hast thou here any besides son in law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatever thou has in the city, bring them out of this place, for we'll destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the Lord, of uh, before the face of the Lord, and the Lord had sent us to destroy it. When the probation of the unbelievers, when the probation of the Sodom and Gomorrah closed, he says now, do you have any other person left? We're going to destroy this place. Hurry, bring them. Let us go out with them. Remember at this point, when this message is being said, the two virgin daughters are in the house. Don't also forget, the wife of Lord is also in the house. To make matters better, the wife of Lord, after this warning is post, sent out in an expedition to look for his other children who are in Sodom to pass the warning message of the angels. And so she declares it out. Remember our topic is, will the investigation favor you? Remember they have come for an investigation and the point to which we have reached, they have concluded their investigation and probation has closed and they are out ready to destroy the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah because they have just confirmed and rejected divine mercy. And so they ask, is there anybody? The Bible says they go out and try and look for uh, uh, people, uh, their relatives who are still in Sodom, so that at least they can rescue them out. But they take it as a trivial matter. And so when the angels see that they are wasting time, the Bible says, look at the grace of God. How sweet, amazing grace, how sweet the sound of a 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful unto him, they brought him forth and sent him out without the city. That is what we call amazing grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace that reaches out to us even when we seek not God. When the inhabitants of, uh, of heaven realize that Lot is dilly darling, is wavering whether to come out or not, they hold his hands, hold the daughter's hands, hold the wife's hands, and they take them out of Sodom. Did you know that is what sometimes God do to us? Sometimes the Lord blocks you from getting some things for your own interests. You are busy chasing things that God had prevented you from, and yet he did that for your own interest. Why are you insisting on bribing your way to get that job and it is not the desire of job for you to have it because he knows it to lock you out of the kingdom. His mercy has denied you those many applications you have sent to those companies. He knows why. Wait upon him. Why are you insisting that you have to get married to that man when your parents are actually telling you that that man will not help you spiritually? Why are you insisting? Why are you insisting you have to be married to that lady when from the estimation of men of experience, from estimation of God's word, you are operating on a principle against that says the Lord. Why are you insisting? You are insisting is putting yourself on an enchanted ground and you will get married to him because you wanted to quench your own desires. Two years down the line in marriage, 
at the middle of the night, you turn and look at your partner and ask God, what did you give me? No, sir, no, madam, it's not God. You insisted on that. When God prevents you from getting something, ensure you be patient and wait for him to give another direction. So was the case of Lot. The Lord prevented him from remaining in Sodom and Gomorrah, took him out and the family, and they set out. Remember who is going out of Sodom? Lot, number one. Two, his wife. Three, his two daughters, who are virgins. Don't forget that. They are going out of Sodom and Gomorrah. As they set out of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible explains right there. You will go through it. They are given instruction not to look back, to move forth without focusing back. And so our first problem arises. Our topic is, will the investigation favor you? Remember, as far as where we've reached is concerned, the investigation has already worked against our first group, the non-believers of Sodom. They already left inside Sodom and fire and brimstone has been powered to finish them inside there. So investigation that heaven had sent to be done has already not favored them. Why? Because they neglected heavenly sent reproofs. Don't forget that. Two, a second person gets out of Sodom. And after he has moved some distance from Sodom, she starts remembering, ah, uh, ah. Uh, do you mean the little shop at the mall of Sodom? Only, only use the microphone as you come in, sister. God bless you. I knew you didn't intend that. God bless you so much for being uh, sensitive. As they live out, Lot's wife starts remembering that shop, that boutique that we had in the little mall of Sodom. Does it mean that we are leaving it? Uh -uh, uh -uh. That particular education system that my daughters were already subjected to, does it mean that we are leaving it? <clears throat> are you serious, Lord, that the car that you bought just the other day, we are leaving it? What about the plots we've built in Sodom and Gomorrah? We are leaving them. Uh, this is unbelievable. I can't. And so, just to confirm the desires of her mind, she turns back and looks to Sodom, and the investigation disfavors the second person. Lord's wife. She is finished right there. Jesus Christ in the New Testament remembers that and says, remember Lord's wife. Now let me tell you four things that you ought, or three or four things that you need to remember about Lord's wife. One, remember that she was Lord's wife. That Lord was righteous, but despite the fact that she was righteous, the righteousness of Lord couldn't save his wife, whose heart was back in Sodom when God was taking them out of Sodom. The investigation had to work against Lord's wife because that was her choice. Two, remember that she made her some steps towards salvation. Don't forget that. Remember that Lot's wife makes, made some steps towards salvation. She was not actually destroyed with the fire and brimstone that the Lord poured on Sodom. She was out of it. Neither was she with Adma or Bezoim. She was out of Sodom and Gomorrah and its neighboring cities. She made some steps to be saved. Listen, brothers and sisters. The investigation may still work against your favor, even if you've made some steps, because she says, Ellen White, almost said, is totally lost. Number three, remember, she was finished right in that particular act of disobedience. A lot sometimes usually uh, waits for some time before he vindicates his judgment. But at some instances, he usually gives his judgment there and then. And so that it was the case of Lot's wife. And she's the second person now who the investigation is working against her favor. Remember our topic is, will the investigation favor you? Now, they're out. They've moved far. Zohar, after some time, they've left Zohar because also Zohar had to be destroyed and they proceed to the mountains. Now, Lot has remained him and his two daughters. Now, follow closely. And the Bible says there, after Lot has remained with his two daughters, uh, chapter 19 is where we are from verse 30. It says, Lot went up out of Zohar 
and dwelt in the mountain. And his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zohar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Now listen to verse 31. Astonishing things about virgins who had ever, never known a man. To mean if you get that somebody is a virgin, you know, he's morally upright. But I want to present to you immoral virgins. Immoral virgins. Look at what they do. They say, and the first one said unto the younger, 31, our father is old. Our father is old. And there is not a man in the earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the first one went in and lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. 34. And it came to pass on the morrow that the first one said to the younger, behold, a lady has started with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also. And go thou in and lie with him, and that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus, verse 36, the daughters of Lot with, were with child by their father. Oh, he is called a just man by the apostle Peter, but I say, Lot is one of the scandalous Russia's men in the Bible. He meets daughters who are evil, evil virgin daughters, who seeks the attention of their father after, after cheating him in the influence of alcohol. Now, let me now go back why I had uh, asked you a question. By the time Lot was proposing that I have two daughters here, they have never known a man. Do you think in the mind of the daughters there was purity? No. Absolutely. And this proves it. They might have been physically pure, but morally, but in their hearts, but in their minds, they were impure. It's only an occasion that have not been found for them to exercise their immorality. Brothers and sisters, are you only outward attractive, but yet inside you, you possess a longing to go against God. Do you profess a high standard of holiness? Do you stand on the pulpit to rebuke sins of which it's only a chance that you've not find to uh, practice it? But when a chance arises, since you are not moving steadfully, you may fall into the trap. That was the case of the daughters of Lot, and they end up bringing societies or people who are the most stubborn people to the children of God, the Moabites and Ammonites. We talked about them yesterday, as you remember, they are the, the struggle, the war that Uriah and Joab had taken out the children of Israel to go and wait. Now, the third group that as well fails in the investigation, the daughters of Lot. Now, follow me closely. Lot's wife, the investigation worked against her because she decided to focus on that which the Lord has called her out of. The inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, the investigation, investigation acted against their favor because they trifled with heavenly sent warnings. The daughters of, uh, uh, how do you call them, uh, lords, the investigation acted against them because while they were outwardly pure, inwardly they were impure. They only possessed that which can be said as outward purity. But inward, they were amorous. They were immoral to the highest degree. Somebody will think of sleeping with the father as long as, even if he's a virgin, you see the level of immorality that this person has. And let me connect this to you and me. Because the scripture were written for our admonition, as unto whom the ends of the earth has come. Just the same way, there was an investigation that was sent to Sodom and Gomorrah. In the same way, there is an investigative judgment going on in heaven. The Lord is proceeding with an investigative judgment in heaven. 
Paul writes in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1. Move with me quick there so that I lay a foundation. My time is running out. And if I'll extend with some 10 minutes today, kindly uh, excuse me. You won't uh, fall down for that. The Lord will keep you safe in that. I say the book of Hebrews chapter 8 because this message is very much important as equal as the other one. And uh, it'll extend just a little bit for us to lay proper foundation. Hebrews chapter 8, the Bible says, now of the things which we have spoken spoken this is the sound we have an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven a minister in the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the lord pitched and not man there god is carrying out an investigation is carrying out an investigative judgment for the inhabitants of us. And the question is, will the investigation favor you? Not just that. When Jesus remembers that he sacrificed his life for us, He not only intercedes for us, Abraham was interceding for Lot and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah before the Father. And at this time, when Jesus Christ is doing an investigation while interceding in heaven, he has sent warnings in the three angels. warnings to the inhabitants and whether it is determined on how me and you will handle the warnings of heaven. The question once again I ask you, will the investigation favor you? Are you trifling with heavenly sent warnings? How are you handling the warnings that God gives us here, even through the three angels' messages? How are you handling them? Are you trifling with them? Are there messages for you are hearing and not a message for a daily practice in your life? You are in the danger that you will not receive the favor of the investigation at the end of the investigative judgment. The investigation should work to your favor. How? By not neglecting, not operating against heavenly sent warnings. But apart from that, are you in any way concentrating on the world and its affairs? to a point you're losing focus of cooperating with Jesus Christ in the closing scenes as he does the work of redemption. Revelation 14 verse 4 says, those who will benefit from the closing works, closing work of the Savior in the sanctuary are those who follow the Lamb with us wherever he goeth, yeah? even inside the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. I ask you again, are you cooperating with Jesus Christ in the closing work of redemption as he seeks to blot out your sin and my sin? Are you doing all in your power by his grace on earth? To cooperate with him or are you neglecting heavenly sent warnings are you really focusing on the world and its treasure and losing focus of the investigative judgments let me read a verse that we read some days ago reputation is necessary for the purpose of teaching and emphasis move with me to the book of luke chapter 12 the apostle luke writes a very important thing there luke chapter 12 Verse 15, he poses a warning and uh, he writes there the words of Jesus Christ himself. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of the covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. Why does Jesus Christ say so? That a man's heart does not is not found in the abundance of things that he possesses. The reason why he says so is because where your heart is, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. He says in verse 34, he says in verse 34, where your treasure is, is where your heart also is. And I ask you, when Jesus is doing the investigative judgment in heaven, where is your treasure? Is it on earth or in heaven? If it's on earth, you are in the danger of being like Lot's wife. 
you are in danger of not benefiting from the benefits of the investigative work in the sanctuary above because your focus has shifted from heavenly things to earthly things and you are focusing on how to advance yourself materially and other spheres and forgetting the most important thing of preparing your soul for the soon and second return of Jesus Christ. Let me ask again, once again, I ask you as your brother in love, will the investigation favor you? Are you trifling with heavenly sent warnings? Are you focusing on the world, but even more painful as the daughters of God? Are you professing a religion that is mechanical with not the love of Jesus Christ in you? Are you having hot wax, but with a cold heart? Are you having the Laodicean problem that you neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm inside the state of your heart is selfishness, is pride, is envy, and yet outside you have a lot of happy Sabbath, the Lord is good, God loves you. Are you possessing a mechanical Christianity? The word leads now a practical Christianity. Ellen what says the word needs what it needed 19 years ago, and that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It needs the revelation of Jesus Christ, brethren. And so I ask you again, will the investigation favor you or it will work, act, sorry, against your favor? Now listen again. I read now from my favorite writer out of the Bible, I'm going to read with you from the book, uh, Great Controversy. The book, Great Controversy, I'm going to read for you from the topic, Facing Life Records, and the uh, uh, page is 482. It says there, 482, the first paragraphs, every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Let me pause there. Every man's work individually, not as the family life youth, mm -mm, not as seventh day Adventists. You know, we like identifying ourselves in groups. God does not handle us in groups. He handles us individually as though you are the only person living on earth. If I mention for our case here, God handles, for example, Kevin as if you are the only person who lives on earth. Lizzie, as if you are the only person who lives on earth. Daniel, as if you are the only person who lives on earth. And all of us who are listening here, he does not handle us in a group. And the question is, when the Lord narrows you singularly, will the investigation favor you? He says, opposite its name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness. Every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, every secret sin with every artful dissembling, heaven sent warnings rejected, reproofs neglected, Wasted moments, those moments that you waste, and improved opportunities, the influence exacted for good or for evil with its far reaching results, all are chronicled by the recording angel. Listen to that, brethren. The Bible says that you and me, our work passes in review before God as if we are the only people existing on earth. The wasted moments are chronicles. When you're supposed to sit down with a Bible study and build up your Christian character, you are busy following up a series ah, that is so painful to God. When you are supposed to be sitting down to study God's word, you are busy following up programs in the television which do not build you up spiritually. Wasted moments. How many people have influenced strongly by your Christian conduct? chronicled with terrible exactness. And the question is, will the investigation favor you with the lifestyle that you are leading? Will the investigation favor you? The heavenly century proofs that you're neglecting, will the investigation favor you? That is the question. But brethren, this particular evening, I want to tell you once again from this same chapter, page 488, it says, those who will share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perform holiness in the fear of God.
The Bible says there, thank you for that. Uh, the inspiration says there, those who will share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Now listen to the next uh, statement. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, or to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. Instead of wasting these moments when Christ is investigating in place and in things that don't add your spiritual value, spare them in studying truth. She says, all need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of the great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the field faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Now listen to the last bit of it. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. That should challenge you as you bid to me, brethren. Every individual, Robinson has a soul to save or to lose as an individual. Not me, even with the wife of whom we share a bed. We do, we do not appear before the judgment of God as a couple individually. And so it is with you and any other person hearing. We have a case before the, uh, the judge of heaven. And the question is, will the investigation favor you? And she says down there, each must meet the great judge face to face. What would you do if you meet him face to face? Will the investigation favor you? Each must meet the great judge face to face. Then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened. When you stand in your lots, will the investigation favor you? As I bring this to a close, I want to speak to you directly, brethren. What are you involving in now that is going to make the investigation to work against your favor. The process in heaven, the jury section that is proceeding, Christ investigating and interceding, what is going to make you not benefit from the investigation? It's only one thing, it's called sin. And I want to remind you that God has provided a solution for sin and it is found in the blood of Jesus. That powerful hymn that I love says, would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood of Jesus. Would you are evil, a victory win? There is power in the blood of Jesus. Listen, the blood of Jesus does not only offer remission for our sins, but also offer victory for sin. Ah, people have said, and many stuff that we are distanced from you, but let me say it on your behalf, amen for that, that we are not only offered a remission for sin, but we are given victory over sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. No need to maintain yourself in sin again, because Jesus wants the investigation to be for your favor. He's not before God to penalize you. He's before God to intercede for you. He's not before God to show him how sinful you are. He is before God to tell him, now God, I have died for his sin and because he's seeking your face, forgive him and accept him. The question is, are you cooperating with him so that the investigation will favor you? Let me bring this now finally. And as I read one classic quotation, from the book Steps to Christ, one of my best from her writings. From the book Steps to Christ, I read a, a very important thing. The page there is 47. She says, many are inquiring, how am I to make surrender? How am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life to sin. Your promises and resolution are like ropes of sun. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affection, the knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. Ah, but she says you need not to, be, to despair. The fact that in the past you had repented of an act and you went back to it again. Don't despair. Don't despair, friend. There is hope for you. The investigation can still act against your favor. How? She says, 
what you need to understand is the true force of the will that is powerful. What you need to understand is the true force of the will, she says, this is the governing power in the nature of man. The power of choice and of decision. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men. It is ours to exercise. She says theirs, but I say ours. It is ours to exercise the power of choice. You cannot give your heart to Jesus. You cannot of yourself give yourself to God its affection. You can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to do and to will according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. Your affection will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Brethren, it's not too lost for you. The investigation can act to your favor. Desire for goodness and holiness, he says, are right as far as they reach. You decide to be a Christian, that is good. You decide to do God's will, that is good. But if you stop there, it will avail nothing. She says, many will die while hoping and desiring to be Christian. Why? They do not come to the point of yielding to the will of God. They do not now choose to be Christians. Brethren, have you chosen to be a Christian? If you've not chosen, choose by not trifling with heavenly sent warnings, by not putting your affections on the things of the world, by not obtaining a mechanical Christianity. Choose to be a Christian and the investigation will work on your favor. Finally, through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. Willpower, by yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself to the power that is above principalities and power. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast and thus constant surrender to God. You will be enabled to live the new life and even the life of faith. How sweet to not that. This evening, as I close this down, brethren, the investigation can act in your favor on a condition that you exercise the will power. Exercise your power of choice. Whatever you have a choice to do the wrong, you also have the choice to do the right. Exercise the power of choice. God's grace is sufficient because in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And this evening has the jury as the judge of heaven and earth, who is equally our intercessor, who is equally our elder brother, who is equally our redeemer, is asking, will my investigation act to your favor? And he says, I want it to work into a favor. Just do one thing. Don't trifle with heavenly sent warnings. Two, ensure you are not focusing on worldly things. Third, ensure you don't possess a mechanical Christianity. Be practical from heart and from action. May the Lord bless us as we reflect upon this and as we act towards the investigation being towards our favor. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, thank you because of the message of this evening. Thank you because the question is, will the investigation be to our favor? And we are supposed to answer, answer that question in the affirmative direction, yes. But answering it verbally is one thing. Practically, it's a different thing, God. So we ask you, give us grace not to trifle with heavenly sent warnings. Give us grace, God, not to in any way focus on the worldly things. Let us take our affections from the world and put them on heavenly things. Three, God help us by your grace. Possess a Christianity that is in and out. And with that, we are sure that the investigation will be true our favor. Thank you for listening. Bless all the listeners. Impress this message manifold upon our hearts for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.
Amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Robinson. And that was a powerful message. Ah, let us all learn to focus our lives unto Jesus. We'll close our evening session with hymn number 109, uh, proposed by Isaiah, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving God. Marvelous grace of our loving God, sing. Marvelous grace of our loving God, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that you pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves called. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace and toll. Points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Praise, grace, God's praise, praise that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, marvelous grace, bring on all you that are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all. Amen. Lizzie, who has given us our closing prayer? Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we stand before the presence again this evening, thanking you for, for coming down, Lord, and showing us your ways, Lord, Father, this evening, Father in heaven. Lord, we are sinners, Lord, before your face. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, Lord. Let us accept who we are and be able to come unto you, Lord, with uh, for, uh, asking for forgiveness, Lord, in truth, in spirit, Lord, Father in heaven. Father, Lord, we thank you for the word, Lord, that you have given us through Brother Robinson, Lord. Let us keep whatever we've learned, Lord, uh, into practice, Lord, Father in heaven. Lord, as we go into your Sabbath, Lord, may you please help us. Keep it holy, Lord, and let us serve even at our homes, Lord, in heaven. Lead us in the first of your name, Lord, for this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for that. And uh, I want to thank you so much. Uh, Brother Robinson for the powerful message that